Yo, what's good? This is Dylan from Producer Grind here at the Producer Grind office. Uh, we got my boy Nonstop the Hitman in the building. Okay, my boy. What's good? But yeah, um, this is actually uh, the first episode we're doing of the podcast. Uh, you know, with camera and everything. Uh, if you guys are tuned into our old podcast, the Producer Lifestyle podcast that we had about 11 episodes, had a whole bunch of people on there from Red Drum, Polo Boy Shardy, King Drum Dummy, uh, Gazin, um, shoot. Uh, DJ Payne one, Cassius J, we got a whole bunch of people, but uh, starting off brand new here at the office. So, uh, but yeah, um, let's go with you, bro, man. Man, grinding. I feel you, I feel you. <laughs> like a producer poster. Uh, yeah. I see you already starting the year off dope using Culture 2. Yeah, yeah. Now, what joint? I didn't even hear. I'm not even gonna lie. I didn't even listen to Culture 2. I'm gonna see if I can pull it up. What joint did you do? I did, uh, I did the Made Man. Made Man. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, tell me a little bit about like, uh, you know, you come up a little bit, you know, a little bit about your story. I mean, well, shit, I started a while ago. I started uh, like, my first placement was 10 years ago. Mm. And I was with Twister. With, uh, we did a record called, hey, uh, shit, what was it, Wrist Day Rocky? It was on his uh, Adrenaline Rush 2. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was cool. I don't even know if the album went gold or nothing, but it was my first big. I felt like I was about to be in mansions and Lambos and everything after that. Like, really? <laughs> I thought I was on. At that point, uh, Twister was like pretty. He was like on the downswing, but he was still pretty big. But I mean, we got that. And then uh, I moved to Atlanta. We came to shoot the video for that. And uh, I just ran into everybody when I was out here. Was Chingy, Nelly, Luda, the whole field mob, everybody that was popping at that time. And they always like move down here. It's a good opportunity, you know what I'm saying? Better than Portland. Like, I mean, really ain't nothing going on out there. Mm-hmm. Like, we got probably like, shit, a total of like six or seven like plaques in the whole, the city. whole city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, we it's it's a flyover town. You know what I'm saying? Big 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 uh, productions barely come there, but when they do, like, I mean, the city don't even really support it. Like Seattle. Sacramento, you know what I'm saying? Nobody really stops in between and goes to Portland. But so I came out, started linking with the locals and shit out here, and I mean, just one thing led to another, and I started getting like good connections with a lot of people that was making moves, and that turned to me putting beats in a lot of people's hands that I didn't have no access to. So I mean, it really was just one connection to another. Nothing was really planned out. I didn't like put no no beat catalog together and say, I'm about to get this just to such and such, yeah. like, none of that. I didn't chase nobody down. I was just, like, in the right place at the right time over and over again, which eventually led to me uh, getting cool with, with Southside and Waka and everybody, and and that's when uh, we started kind of, like, bridging that gap and doing the 808 Mafia, like, collabs with me, and then Southside was like, man, you might as well just be from the squad. I don't know why you ain't been putting a tag on the beach yet, so I'm like... I shit, I'll do that, you know what I'm saying? And but uh I don't know, I did the Yo Gotti Everybody was my first like single. Everybody wanted to do that? Yeah. Yeah, that's your heart. And uh that was like kinda when I started getting recognition and that's when I started to like get like publishing companies hitting me and everything was that they, they knew it was something there. But I mean I had been placing it just really wasn't like a lot of big records until then. And then after that, I started getting in cool with everybody. Shit, that was a, that was a, and then when we had came in one day for the everybody joint and, and uh, they were doing a remix and Wayne was in the booth doing it, I'm like, oh shit, I got Wayne on my beat now. Like, it just felt like everything was about to change from that point. I mean, it pretty much did. Like, after that, that was like when I started really like getting my foot in the door. So like, uh, you know, what kind of opportunities, you know, stem from that? From everybody, well, uh, that did that really like change your life, really? Like, yeah, I mean, I got, I, I signed a cool little pub deal with a boutique at that point. That I mean, they gave me a nice little chunk of change, and that kind of just helped like alleviate the stress. I didn't really have to worry about nothing. It, it went from me needing a support system for me to produce to me being my own support system to where I didn't have to worry about bills and whatnot. Like, I could just kind of kick my feet up and create. And it's easy to get complacent when you get a little money in your pocket. <laughs> like the hardest part is working. And that's one thing that working with the, the big artists that I've worked with, like when I work with them closely, I get a chance to see like how they work so feverishly and they, they already eaten. So it's like they should be full, but they still working like 
they don't have anything in their stomach, you know what I'm saying? And that, like, inspired a lot. Like, Party Next Door, I've been working with him for, like, the last four months. And every time I go in the studio with him, we probably cut about 17 records. Yeah. Like, and it'd be, like, within a night, you know what I'm saying? We doing five, six, seven, eight finished records front to back and then come in and do it the next sleep for a little bit. Not even really sleep, just take a nap and wake back up and get right back on it. And walking in through his house, you see it's just littered with plaques. And I'm like, damn, I didn't know he wrote so many records. You know what I'm saying? It's just plaque after plaque after plaque. And he's still, he still grinding like he don't got shit. And that inspired me a lot. You know what I'm saying? That, that's what I do now. Like, I just wake up, open my blinds, look at the sky, learn and make beats. <laughs> that's it. Mm -hmm. So like signing the pub deal, did that, uh, you know, change your lifestyle? Like, were you flying places more? Or, you know, did they have you in the studio with people more? Or was it kind of just you continue doing what you were doing? But I was, I was able to do, I was able to get there where I wanted to be on my own. You know what I'm saying? Excuse me. I was able to go, uh, basically book the flights and stuff on my own. It was, it wasn't necessarily no, no, no dig at the pub company, but they weren't really involved in like helping me place. So, I mean, I kind of just really needed the money at that point, you know what I'm saying? So it was, but I mean, it wasn't like the kind that they were so, they were actively pushing and promoting me, you know what I'm saying? But I mean, either way, like now I got some stuff on the horizon right now that they're, they'll be pretty involved. So, I mean, I ain't gonna go too far into details until it's solidified, but like, I'll be murdered next year. <laughs> Are you independent right now? Are you signed to? Uh, nah, I'm not signing to anybody really, but uh, but Party and Drake have been talking a lot about signing me. So I just I don't know. I got just got a text last night from them talking about about to have a draft towards me. So mm -hmm. that's real dope, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Definitely dope. Do you um, do you encourage like upcoming producers to get a pub deal? No. I mean, if you need the money, yeah, but I wouldn't encourage it unless you had a very good deal. But if you upcoming and you don't really have anything in the pipeline, then I wouldn't. I wouldn't because you pretty much you you get a good record and that's going to benefit the pub company more than you. So the pub companies will knock at your door regardless if you got records. And not every pub company, unless you're talking about the Warner Chapels and the big boys, you know what I'm saying? They're not really going to be trying to actively push you. They don't really have many clients to push you on, so I, I wouldn't. First of all, my big question is, are you just getting, when you have a big record, or is, as a producer, if you don't sign a work for hire, you don't sign an agreement, is that song 50% yours, like sales and everything? Yeah, yeah. you get like I the way how I negotiate everything because I was lucky enough to like I had I got in line with Sha Money early on uh, in my career 2012 I did a whole lot of stuff with with uh, Jewels we did the Guy Willing mixtape up mm. in, in in New York finished that up and while I was doing it I had uh, I got a, started to kind of build a little relationship with Sha Money and Sha he kind of had a bad rap at the time but like he was a real good he was real cool real transparent good dude to me you know what i'm saying so he helped me uh line me up with a good lawyer that basically was making sure that whenever there was a placement in the works like i had my just do i had everything that was coming my direction my publishing my mechanicals my my royal everything from the from the sale mechanicals to all the way on to uh, publishing so it's like I was cool and my advance I was getting 10 bands each beat so it was like it was cool and everything was all inclusive too so they had to pay my lawyer on top of me so it wasn't like it was getting cut into my shit you know what I'm saying like I got lucky but every, a lot of it really just depends on like how well you can negotiate like one thing that up and coming producers get afraid of is that they gonna talk themselves out of a out of a placement but they want your record They'll pay it. They'll pay. They got money. They'll pay what you want. You just got to know how to stand up for yourself. Now, what about these things where they'll go, people say, you know, they'll go and remake your beat. You know what I mean? No. That's Cut why I, hey, I've seen that happen with like A&Rs and shit. That's why I don't really send beats to A&Rs. Like, because I'd rather work with the with the artist themselves. And a lot of the times, like having an A&R around or giving beats to an A&R will pretty much put you in a situation where you're still have to get filtered through a whole nother channel 
while when if you just got in a studio with your artist, even though that's not, it's easier said than done. It's not as easy to get into the studio with an artist as I'm making a scene, but you go directly to the source then, you know what I'm saying? You main vein it at that point. So, I mean, when it comes down to it, the, I wouldn't send shit to A&Rs at this point because they might get kind of, they might shy away from 808 Mafia's got been, had a cool little run recently, so they know that we ain't, you know what I'm saying, charging no 3500 or nothing, so they might end up having a little in-house producer do it, but I don't know, We I just, I stay in with, I don't even fuck with A&Rs, like, I mean, ain't nothing wrong, I ain't got nothing against A&Rs out there that, I mean, whoever listening, I, I know I got a couple relationships with some cool A&Rs, but if an A&R hit me up out the blue I don't have no relationship with, I usually don't even open the email. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Yeah. Um, Talk about, you know, your daily lifestyle now, like, what, you know, what it's really it consists of. Man, working. That's it. I, Like I said, after I started, uh, after I locked in with Party and seen how hard he would grind, like, I mean, he'll stop basically just to go to a photo shoot or an event, come back and work, keep working. And we was, I was on tour with him for probably like six dates along the East Coast. And and even then, we were working the whole time. And we work, he'd get up, get out of the uh, tour bus and go and, and do a show. Got a 45 minute set, come back out. And we had arenas, you know what I'm saying? Come back out, ain't no party and no nothing. Straight back to work. So sure. that's all I do. I got, I, I make so many beats now that I don't even label them. Like I label them by the date. Cause it take too long for me to, you know what I'm saying, try and think of a name for the beat. So now I just label it the date and then put a, the corresponding letter after it. So first B to be the date, second B to be the date with an A at the end and B, C all the way up. Now my, I usually make beats every day all the way up to like J, K, M. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's like yeah, like ten beats. <laughs> Easy, <laughs> that's dope. Now you 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 uh structuring them and everything, or just you know making loops and kind of push, keeping them pushing. Uh, I I say out of all out of all the way up to L or M, I probably have like complete front to back like six complete beats, and then like a good five or six like almost complete ideas. That all I gotta do is just is arrange them. Mm. Uh, talking about uh, saturation, five to ten years down the line, what are some things that, like you know, because it's going to be have to be something that you got to do different to stand out, like Period. you know, and make sure you got a job. Like, well, what what are some of the things you're thinking about as far as job security five ten years down the line? Well, I mean, I don't really fall in line with the typical 808 mafia sound. Like, I could do that, but that's not where I come from. Being from the West Coast, I got more like a lot more musicality. Like I grew up on like the Battle Cats and all that C Walk, B Walk music and shit. Like we were using like different chord structures and shit and different arrangements. Like I feel like however the industry decides to like whatever direction it decides to go, I'll be able to keep up with it because the background I have isn't just trap beats. You know what I'm saying? Like I could do it all, but I feel like to stand out five to ten years from now. <coughs> I mean, it really just depends on like these next couple of months. If I'm placing Drake and 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 all these big wigs, then I mean, I got a feeling that people be trying to keep up with me. <laughs> Facts, I feel you. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know. It's all about confidence. It's all about standing up for yourself, being confident, and keeping it pushing. Like uh, this industry is cutthroat, and I seen it with even with this situation, with like the Migos shit. Like if I wouldn't have stood up for myself, I wouldn't have got credited for it. Mm. So it was like I was pissed off when that Migos shit first came out. Cause I didn't, it was like it wasn't my tag on that beat. I'm like, hold on, he ain't pressed no not one key on this shit. Mm. So it made me mad, you know what I'm saying? But. Like, I mean, I was able to get everything straightened away with the label and I went directly to the source and then I made sure that they, you know what I'm saying? They, everything, like for the physical copy I'll be on there, they already changed it all uh, for like the Wikipedia and all the digital downloads. But I mean, the tag is still on there, which is probably irritate me for the rest of my life. But <laughs> I mean, cause if you think about it, that was a big opportunity that I missed when Quavo released that, the, uh, Produce production credits. Yeah, the and picture went, thing. And yeah. it went viral. Yeah, like my name was supposed to be on there, yeah, but it sure. wasn't. So it's like that probably will piss me off till the day I die. But <laughs> I'm not gonna harp on it. Like when it comes down to it, I got so much good stuff, like in the works, 
and even this alone like one thing i realized is that when every time you have a blessing it comes with a testing like you get tested to the point to where it's going to try to make you like it's going to try to sidetrack you and it's going to try to try to you know what i'm saying dull the shine of what you just did it's going to take your attention off of that so i try not to i try to just keep it pushing and stay you know what i'm saying focused and be and be thankful for what i did get but i don't know i mean it is what it is that's life bittersweet right bittersweet but more sweet than bitter so i ain't tripping for sure for sure <laughs> no i could definitely relate to that man like just especially you know we just we had some issues you know with our uh trip to baltimore you know yeah. some events you know some some bumps in the road but overall you know it was dope you know yeah bittersweet but more sweet than bitter for sure exactly oh uh, yeah I'm about, to, uh, I'm about to play the records like i said i haven't heard any of the records on culture let alone this one so i'm just gonna play a little bit all right but yeah, uh, bringing my boy Letter L to the stage or the, to the table, whatever we call Yo, it. Yo, what up? <laughs> Shout out my boy Letter L. What but, up, what up? Um, yeah, L, uh, for uh, everyone that was in Baltimore, everyone that wasn't L was, you know, the host of the VIP showcase that we just did. So, but yeah, what's good, bro? What's good, fam? Glad to be here. What's, what's up, nonstop, man? How you doing today, man? Man, doing real good, man. So, you know, deal. I was telling you um, a story I had met um, nonstop back at a uh, producer event back in the summer, right? Man, you know I like to ask these non-music questions, man. I, um, you had told a story about uh, some of your experiences um, back on the West Coast, man. I don't know if you remember this. You was talking, and you had to let them know you had that thing on your hip, man. Oh, yeah. uh, you, had be cra- you had to be cracking up that day, man. But, uh, <laughs> you was talking about just some of the stuff you had gone through back home, and I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, kind of the beginning and getting out of Portland and all that. I mean, well, I really wasn't even, like... I didn't really have a goal to be a producer because I started out banging. So it was like, I just wanted to be the Michael Jordan, the gang banger. I wasn't thinking about <laughs> playing no keys or nothing. Right. So it was like, I mean, shit. I, luckily, like, I had some homies that was all trying to rap at the time. And, I mean, they, you know what I'm saying? They was having these little weak-ass beats and shit around. And I'm like, these is trash. I hear way better shit in my head. Just right. Like, <laughs> get me in the studio let me play these keys and it's early on it's early 2000s so it was like it was still like full on it was no none of this i mean there was reason and logic were like the only two things and like fruity loops demos and shit like right that was it but like it really was it was all still equipment so uh we had a dude in our hood that had a uh he thought he was a little producer. He was garbage as fuck, but he had a uh, <laughs> he had a Triton. So I yeah. it ran out, you know what I'm saying? Give him $5 an hour, I go in there and make beats and everything I'm making was hard. So, but like I was rapping really at first and yeah. I was the best rapper out there too. So it was like, I started out like as a solo artist and just producing all my own shit, you know what I'm saying? Right. And, and mixing and designing my cover and doing everything. That's dope. And then, uh, I mean, it was still like the street shit, the street element was still pulling me back though. So it was like I was lining up with a lot of good, you know what I'm saying, people because whenever somebody did come to town, like the radio station believed in me. So they had me out, you know what I'm saying, rubbing shoulders with Diddy and Ice Cube and Snoop and Jazzy Faye and everybody that was big in 0405. Mm-hmm. Right, Rick Ross, I met him when he first first really started popping. So it was like, uh, like I had, I had the gang banging shit pulling me away from that. So it was like the placement that brought me down to Atlanta was what kind of separated it all. That's when I was finally able oh, to get man. away from that. You know what I'm That's saying? Cool. Before that, it was just like I'd be in the studio, my big homie rest in peace. He had bought me a Triton eventually. And uh I'd be making beats and they hear about shit. I mean, y'all fixed y'all on some bullshit, man. And I heard about this and blah, 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 this and that, man, man, shut your ass up. You know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> and then uh, one day, you know what I'm saying? The hood got hot, some little bullshit went on. Hood got hot, so I went off to my little honeycomb. You know what I'm saying? And while I'm out there, uh, my mom called like, man, Dar just came and got the Triton. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, Dar just came and got the Triton. So I come back to the hood and Man, it was Big Funk <laughs> with the big homie. You was like, hold on, man. He gave it to some people that we was beefing with. So it was like, oh, man. <laughs> it was, but it was like, there was family and shit of his and family of ours. The thing about Portland is 
the black community is so small out there that all the gangs are really closely knit like everybody's family i got family from like six different hoods so it's like and we beefing with all of them you know what i'm saying and yeah. and and me like shit being the like I'm the lightest one from the hood. Everybody used to, everybody used to call me white, this and that, blah blah blah. Not knowing, you know, what I'm saying that I'm really. I mean, people in the city know I'm mixed, but at first, don't nobody give a fuck. They just, oh, that's white boy, blah blah blah, whatever. Right. So I used to, used to feel like I had to bang twice as hard to get half of the respect. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, I don't know. It was a different element, but it gave it. I feel like it, it carved me into the person I am now, to where like I don't care. I will stand up for myself. I really feel like that hard edge came from the shit I learned on the streets and seeing all the stuff I seen. Like my big bro got smoked in a church, you know what I'm saying? Like, right there. like that's, you don't hear about that nowhere besides like on movies and shit, you know what I'm saying? And then shit, a couple, uh, like a week and a half after that, little bro, little bro seen the little brother of the dude that smoked my big bro. Uh, and they shot each other You know what I'm saying One of them He uh, His little bro Shot my little bro On the side And so he He had He took it He he ate the shot But it was like in his lung And he shot him in the head And as he running off To the scene You know what I'm saying he, His uh, lung filled up with blood So he basically died On the scene So it was like They killed each other Like And that was within Like a two week span So it was like I mean Being going through shit Like that Kind of like like that that really would make you like well fuck it i don't care like you can suck my dick whoever these little you know what i'm saying the, the artists and whatever if they i don't know it, it make it to where like you could really like stand up for yourself like, after, you, after you've seen some real shit yeah it's like, like it's serious I, yeah exactly because when it come down to it this is all a dream what i'm living right now anyway so right. it's like anything and i know that they want my product or they wouldn't be reaching out to me right i sold dope i know how to sell dope i know you know what i'm saying music is not much different <laughs> when it come down to it and you set your own price and you gotta you know what i'm saying you you set your price high and don't apologize you know what i'm saying yeah like is that one of those things where when we're talking about this whole producer pay conversation and this is something that people don't say are you telling them you got to be ready to walk away if you have to got to yeah I, there's don't never let these labels jerk you around because they will i mean if you if you sit there and say oh well I mean, damn, I might not be able to get this placement because they gonna act like they rushing no matter what. They could say we need to meet deadlines and shit when they know the deadline is six months out. But hurry up and get us the track out because we need to meet these deadlines and blah, blah, blah. They gonna say shit like that regardless. They're just you know? playing games with you, basically. Yeah. Everything is. Mm -hmm. And it's like you can't bullshit a bullshitter. Like, <laughs> I grew up being raised by dope dealers and pimps and gang bangers and everybody else. It's like I know how... To tell, I know how to spot a motherfucker that's trying to, you know what I'm saying, pimp me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I mean, when it comes down to it, these labels is some good pimps. Mm. So you just gotta know how to, like you said, know how to walk away. But the thing is, you walk away and you gain the control at yeah. that point. You know what I'm saying? Now the labels is like, all right, well, you know what I'm saying? Well, maybe, you know, we could go ahead and work with what, you know what I'm saying? Like, all right, shoot me my 10 bands and get up out of my face, man. Shit. <laughs> That's the part where you pause the podcast and stop and think about what he just said for a second, because that's game right there, Man. for real. That's game. So um, one thing I, I definitely want to ask you about, you know, we do we make sure we do our research and get ready for these podcasts, man. And I saw that um, I, I had been seeing on Instagram. There's this dude that does these like custom roll blunts that look like <laughs> AK-47. Yeah, and it, it, it said, "Yo, like, yo, his homeboy is now stop the hitman." Like, what? Can you tell us about that a little bit, man? Yeah, well, I got, I got. Uh, introduced to him through my other bro that i met through music like music had kind of run run us all together but he was the the son of the owner of arizona ice t <laughs> so i was like he's big balling we going out there fucking with him he like man we need to get the we need to go out there to portland i'm like you going out, out to my city like i mean shit what's up he like yeah we going out there because it's a dude out there named tony Greenhands. He rolled these fat blunts. We go, I'm going to get AWAX and AK for his birthday. I'm going to get you a birthday present, blah, blah, blah. Like, all right, so we fly out there on a fucking private jet. Get out there, pull up. The first time I didn't ever flew a private jet, you know what I'm saying? It's fitting I go to my hometown. So yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling like the president in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> so we get out there and, uh, I mean, shit, we, uh, we link up with him. And he had a fire ass grenade, but it was filled with bomb. Like literally, it was a bomb, bomb ass grenade. So, 
So, I mean, shit, but it was like fully functional. Like, you could pull the pin and you could click the little you know thing. <laughs> uh, and you had to smoke it a certain way. Like, but the pulling the pin was the carb. You know what I'm saying? The shit wow. was crazy. That's dude. crazy. Yeah, I mean, he had some gas. I really don't even remember that day that much because <laughs> the shit we were smoking on had me on another planet. What's your favorite strain? I got, uh, I like this cherry pie right now. I like Dog Walker. I like, uh, this all Portland stuff though. Dog Walker, uh, Obama Kush, uh, Fire. Gorilla Glue is cool. Oh, Gorilla, we was just talking about Gorilla Glue. Can you make beats on Gorilla Glue? I don't really like making beats on any of that setback weed. I need something that's keeping me. That's why I like cherry pie, because it keep your head up. You know, yeah, like yeah. You can go ahead and drink you a coffee and smoke some weed. <laughs> yeah, you know, real yeah. shit. A lot of producers we interview uh, mess with that gelato. Gelato cool, but I feel like that's just like a it's a buzzword right now. So like no matter what out here you're gonna hear motherfuckers saying, I got I got, I got gelato. gelato yeah. Yeah, I got gelato. <laughs> no it ain't. <laughs> no it ain't. But I mean shit, being from the West Coast, like we got it's a candy store in there. You could kinda just close your eyes and point and pick something and it's gonna be fire. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those def, uh raw papers, backwoods. Raw, definitely raw. I used to fuck with backwoods, but I don't know, man. Shit. I already got a deep voice. That shit be <laughs> can't register my shit sometimes when I'm smoking backwoods. We actually have a divide in the uh, producer grind team. It's like half raw papers, half backwoods. Backwoods, backwoods. See, we were smoking backwoods on the West Coast. Like you gotta think, Mac Dre. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, Port yeah. Portland got influenced real heavily by the Bay and LA. Like simultaneously, we had we had the whole gang banging culture of LA, and we had all the sauce of the Bay. So it was like. They fucked with us tough. Mac Dre was up there all the time. You know right. what I'm saying? So, and that's all he smoked with Backwoods. So I was talking about Backwoods and music of mine from 2004. Like, <laughs> right. vet on his Backwoods shit. But, I mean, I don't know. I got burnt out over that shit over the years. I feel like there's more chemicals and shit in it now. But I don't know. Yeah. It feel different. It don't feel the same as it was back when we were smoking packs of Honey Berry. These are come eight in a pack, too. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> on God. Yeah. Now it's just eight dollars for five. Man, <laughs> but I just switched to the uh, raw papers because like I had got this like chest cold, whatever the shit's going around. You know what I mean? Man, so I was like, man, I'm not trying to smoke no backwards. And then I'm just like, shit, I might as well just stick with these raw papers. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you could taste the weed then too, but at yeah. the same time, I like the way backwoods taste. It's a fact. Backwoods taste good. I like the way backwoods taste. Like honey berry backwoods make your shit taste like chocolate cake or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah. So what can we look forward to? What can you talk about that you got coming up that ain't too hush hush in uh, 2018? I got a lot of shit coming up 2018. I got uh, this two chain shit. We uh, we finishing up the deal points on the two chains record. That uh, my bad, y'all. You know, you <laughs> <laughs> Trap uh, phone. People see you go live and then Trap they want to call you anyway, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, bro. We got uh, I got the Two Chains record. I just did a fire ass uh, record with TK the other night. Uh, I got me and Party been going stupid. I think I mean they're going through uh, selection right now, but the label keeps saying they. I think I got like two or three of his singles, and then uh, and then like what, I say, what's the vibe like on those records? Crazy, because I know he does like the, you know a lot of the you Caribbean. Know, yeah, it's more a tempo. Okay. Okay. It's like we got one that sound like Z100 all across the country. That shit gonna be every little white girl's iPod. <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> yeah, shit. That's yeah. what's up, man. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. What about other investments besides music, like rental properties, anything? I mean, I I'm trying to. I'm looking at places right now, but uh, I mean, shit. I made a couple dollars off of the crypto recently. Oh, word. Yeah, I'm good. That's dope. Got lucky and bought everything when it was still hella low. Drop. I got a lot of Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, and Litecoin when it was like, I think Litecoin was like 50 bucks when I got it. Mm -hmm. So I got a gang of it. So it's like that What's shit that just now? floated up to like damn near 300. Mm -hmm. I was looking at my account like, God damn, where all this come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's but, dope. Yeah, other than that, I mean, shit. Uh, I'm trying to branch out and do stuff. My mom, she, uh, a good ass cook. I'm gonna get her a food truck. Mm. Yeah, we gonna make sure we got her. Right. Trying what to throw kind of food she make? 
everything, soul food. She a white woman. She was like the only white lady I knew coming up, but she lived in the middle of the hood my entire life. I thought she was the only white person in Portland at one point. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, cause when, when, I mean, we, when we was coming up, like North and Northeast Portland was the heart of the city. And that was like the black area. No, it's like white people were afraid to come through there, but she was there and accepted. So she soaked up everything. So you know how to cook super good soul food, but. I don't know, I be doing little recipes too, throwing them aside like, Mama, I got you a new little recipe, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe get Mama a recipe book hook up. Oh, God. Yeah, that'd be dope. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and she got these Frenchies too, so I've been cashing out for her to get these new little rare colors and shit, so. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Frenchie pups. Mm-hmm. Did you watch the Grammys? I sure did. I was disappointed that the Migos ain't win. For twofold them is the homies and the homies was good it got grammys off of it but some other homies and shit got i mean like when kendrick lamar won that was dope yeah i i thought it was pretty dope i liked it i liked it the fact that it was such a hip-hop takeover that day yeah yeah we here to really stay like <laughs> i mean it's not like the past 40 years hasn't already said that but like it really shows when it's on the mainstream stage like that yeah yeah most of that. yeah yeah how you feel about selling beats online? I never done it, not once. Never sold not one beat online. I I wouldn't do it because it's it's like I don't think they know how to legislate it right yet. They, like when it comes down to the like you could sell the same beat to five different motherfuckers and like it's not they. I mean from what I heard, this was a few years ago, but there's not really any legalities behind like saying that that's cool. You know what I'm saying? Like. They don't, none of them own any of the rights. I don't know, it's weird. So I heard that, like, if you sell a beat non exclusive, then nobody could collect royalties off of it. Mm. We got to do some research and find out for sure because yeah. I want to know about that. For real, because it's like if you, or like royalty free loops or anything like that, like if it's royalty free, it's royalty free. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't accept royalties off of something that somebody else created royalty free. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's like, when it come down to it but they i feel like they're about to uh like really crack down on that the same way they did with streaming and everything how they mainstreamed it all to now 1500 streams is an album sale and i mean that's dope because then you get an album you know what i'm saying going platinum fast if they got like four or five singles but i think they're going to do the same thing with uh with beats here pretty soon online maybe i don't know maybe they have and i just ain't been keeping up with it but i never saw beats online because of that like i didn't know how to actually do it and i felt like it was kind of like to me it's getting over anyway i mean like you said the same beat to five ten different people like where it don't feel right it don't feel good you know what i'm saying you, you hear four or five different records and they might all be dope they all got the same beat I mean, you can't get excited off of that you know what i'm saying so it's like i never did it i don't got no i done seen a lot of people get big off of that though make a whole lot of money off of uh leasing and and all that old shit like that's cool but i ain't never done it but i got lucky to like get in the position and get kind of like you know what i'm saying get my foot in the door early on before that was really big like when i first started making music it was a website called mp3.com i don't know if y'all remember that mm -hmm. that was like the I first remember actually that yeah. was like the first soundcloud like the first mm -hmm. sound click all that and that sound click came right after that and sound click was more so just like selling your own music and then producers like took that over and started selling beats on it but i never got on the wave i had one little sound click page up with like 10 beats at one point and didn't sell me people was up. banking off sound click at like, one point yeah like, johnny like, giuliano yeah, yeah. and, the, and the, uh, uh superstar O and all them they was going crazy off of that shit yeah i guess they kind of ogs it online now yeah, i ain't realize like, that yeah they low-key paved the way they're the pioneers of the online yeah, shit for the cash apps and everybody else man that's crazy <laughs> okay. uh, what what software you mostly rock with fl studio yeah yeah i was i like i said i i done did i done use pretty much everything i got them all on my computer but that's the one i grabbed the most but uh native instruments be loving me up and they shoot me all their products so it's like i i do both of them like i do the instrumentation the machine and then drag and drop it in the Fruity Loops and then do the drums and, and, and FL. Is, is there a beat where when you say I'm gonna make a beat, I gotta have this VST or I gotta have this certain plugin? Sometimes, but 
I mean, more so, and I don't really do it as much now that I have so many sounds from, from Native Instruments. It's like, I feel like I got every sound. Like, I don't even pull up Nexus or nothing no more. Like, that's probably, that's been shit sitting in the unused VSTs for like a good two, three years. I ain't touched that once. Uh, I pull up Silent pretty much and everything. Omnisphere and everything. Yeah. I pull up, uh, uh huh. Yeah, Machine, Omnisphere. What about the effects plugins? Like gross beats, effect tricks? Gross beats is on everything I do. Right. Is there any uh anything, any any dope effect plugin that people ain't hip to let you drop? Uh Nah, I think uh it's just the way you use it. I, Cause I use gross beat different than everybody else. I don't like some people that just put on a half speed or or the uh was it the triplet, whatever. They'll just mm-hmm. pull that one up and they might do a couple little tape stops or whatever, but like I use it in a different way. And every time I've showed people, they always like, bro, don't show nobody this. Like, <laughs> that's yours. Said they gonna steal this. Like, I was literally waiting to see if he was gonna give this sauce up. <laughs> nah, man, I wish I could. I, I just say I use three different gross beats at this on the same track. Mm. Bro, we was in Baltimore. They asked me about something I did with my bass, and I didn't even realize when I told them. They kind of looked at me like, oh, yeah. And I realized like, oh, I shouldn't be telling people that. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Some things I guess you just gotta keep. Yeah, you gotta go ahead and, you know what I'm saying, lock that one away. I mean, maybe I might let it out a little bit later on down the line, but. When everybody start doing it? Yeah, as of now, I gotta make the money off of this first. I know what I got. <laughs> <laughs> Any mini packs, sound packs, anything coming from you? Uh, yeah, I actually was uh, working on putting together a dope pack. I'm trying to get everybody else from 808 Mafia involved too, but it's, it's so many of us, it's hard to wrangle everybody up, but uh, some. A native instruments uh, pack for machine because mm. we there ain't no really trap based like machine packs. Mm. Like so we gotta get into that. Yeah. Most stuff. Man. And then uh, I mean I've been putting together little stuff. I got a few kits and shit that I'll be like, ah, I'm gonna release this, and I'll be like, nah. <laughs> mm. But I mean everybody from 808 Mafia, we pretty much got the same sound. So it's like you talked about Gazin earlier. He he be lacing us with a gang of sounds and shit too. Yeah, hell yeah, he the plug. Mm-hmm. Guest of the show, alumni. Yeah, hell yeah. He was our first guest. That's the first, first podcast we ever so did. So first podcast you ever did was guessing in the first with a camera is me. So you know what I'm saying? 808 Mafia. <laughs> he stay, man. We fucks yeah. with 808 Mafia. Hell yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Yeah. But shoot, man. I really appreciate you pulling up, man. I appreciate y'all having me. Thank sure, you, man. I love my guy. For sure. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, signing out for this Grind Podcast. Check us out in the next episode. Peace.